Hello, how's it going? Welcome back to the series. So the next task we're going to have is at the moment, our data is hard coded in our shader. That's not so good. Let's set things up so that we can take vertex input. Now, this might seem a little basic, but I'm going to start off with a refresher on things, attributes and such. So let's sort of pop in here. What are some different attributes that we could have? Well, Typically, we'll want to specify a position on the screen that we're rendering to, as well as um, color, if we like, or texture coordinate. And there's heaps of different attributes that we can specify. Now, each of these attributes, you may remember from um, you may remember from OpenGL, each attribute that we put in for a vertex must be between sort of one and four dimensional. So um, what we need to do is take this information for each vertex and somehow sort of pack it into something that our shader can read. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. One is what I call the human readable format. For example, if we're looking at color and position, we would specify one array for all the positions. So we'd have for point one, the X coordinate, point one, the Y coordinate. Then we go to point two and we say point two X, point two Y, and continue on in this way. And then similarly, we have the color and we specify this point by point. So we have point one red color, point one green, point one blue, then on to point two red, and so on. So um, this is a perfectly fine way to do things. I don't quite like it because although it's human readable, it's not very machine readable. Well, it's a lot of jumping around to stitch things together. And more critically, it's sort of making two different vertex buffers. That's not my scene. So there are other ways we can do this. Uh, one way is what I call the flat um, representation, and that is where we have a single sort of array, and the array is um, populated like this. We have point one position in the X, Y, and then point one color in the R, G, B, and then head on to point two, so we have point two X. And continue, continue on from there. That's my preferred method. That's the method that I'm going to be using. Um, but just for variety, there is another method we can use. I don't know if this is the right word for it, but I'm going to call this like a zipped layout, which is pretty similar, pretty similar to the flat layout. But the way this works is we have point one X and then we just have all the positions and then we go point one red we have all the colors so what's your preferred method my preferred method is the vertices method that's that's more straightforward I would say um, but anyway we have that now sort of to tie this to what we've done in the past in OpenGL, we have vertex buffer objects and vertex, vertex array objects. Um, so in OpenGL, we have a vertex array object and a vertex array object holds a vertex buffer object and it also holds um, the attribute pointers, which describe um, describe the data that we've just put in. The vertex buffer object has a bunch of other fields. They are basically the, um, the size and the data, the raw data, the array is held in the vertex buffer object. And then for each attribute, we have an attribute number, we have an offset, a stride and so on, as well as sort of um, 
number of elements for each attribute. And that's, that's all there. Okay, very cool, very cool. So the way we deal with this stuff in Vulkan is sort of analogous to this. Um, we have what's called a binding description. And for the binding description, we specify a binding number. So you might have, you know, this vertex buffer is binding number zero. This storage buffer is binding number one. This texture sampler is binding number two and so on. Um, and then we have a stride, which is basically the number of bytes per vertex in total. And then we have an input rate. So is this per instance data? Is this per vertex data? And so on. So those are, those things are sort of tied up in a binding description. And this is sort of similar to web GPU bind groups, binding group descriptions. It all sort of meshes together. Actually, I've started to understand Vulkan a lot better since I used web GPU, funnily enough. Um, all right. And then we have, as well as that, we have various attribute descriptions. And each vertex buffer will have several attribute descriptions based on the number of attributes that it has. Each attribute description will be associated with a binding number, and that will be the same. These will match up. So if one vertex buffer has three different attributes and it's binding number zero, they will all be binding number zero and they'll have their own uh, locations, which is similar to uh, layout location from OpenGL shaders. Okay. Um, as well as this, we have a format. So what data are we storing? What data type and how many elements? And the offset where that data begins. So apart from renaming these things, they are very similar. They are the same concepts. Now, Another thing which is super important, have you ever noticed in OpenGL, it's weird how you can have, you can almost sort of declare pretty similar layouts between different shaders and it sort of reads them just fine. That's a happy accident, it doesn't always work that way. So what we do is when we are creating a pipeline, we specify the um, binding descriptions and attribute descriptions at pipeline creation and this is thrown into the, it's the vertex input stage is where the shader consumes the data. So that's thrown into the vertex input info um, structure at pipeline creation. So if we have different pipelines which consume different sorts of data, no problem. We throw in different types of attribute descriptions and binding descriptions and that is all good. All right, so the goal is to sort of get our um, binding descriptions and attributes. What we can do is just make a new file. And later on, I'm gonna flesh this out with various sort of model loading things. At the moment, I'm just gonna call it mesh.h. Okay, we'll keep it simple for now. Uh, we'll make a function which will return a uh, binding description for a certain sort of vertex, a vertex which has a position and a color. So it's this vertex input binding description is what we're returning. Now, if we look up in the Vulkan um, documentation, the man pages, we've basically got this sort of struct is what we're working with. It doesn't have a lot of fields, simply has a binding number, a stride, and an input rate. So no problem. So for the time being, we are assuming that we have a binding number of um, zero, which we could set to an argument in future, but for now, we're just going to keep it simple. Going to keep it fixed. So the stride is a number of bytes for each vertex. Each vertex will have two numbers for X and Y position, because I'm just sort of drawing flat on the screen at the moment. 
and three numbers for red, green, blue. So that'll be five floats. And I guess I don't need to specify size of float. I could just go with four, but this looks a little more elegant. So then we have the input rate. I don't know why it doesn't recognize that. Anyway, so we have either instance uh, rate or vertex rate. So instance rate is for instance rendering. When we have like a hundred different times we're rendering the whole thing, we want um, data to be consumed a hundred different times, but right now we're just going to go with per vertex. Okay, so we've got that set up. We can return that. Uh, why can I not type? Return that binding description. Awesome. So in addition to this, we're going to specify the attributes. This is very similar to regular vanilla OpenGL. So we'll go, uh, we're going to have two attributes. And each of them will be a vertex input attribute description. Okay, so the way this works, just bring this over, is for each attribute, we need to describe um, a few things. Location within the shader is this attribute zero, one, two, three, and so on. Uh, binding, which again will be exactly the same as the binding description above. Format, so basically equivalent to, is it a vec2, vec3, vec4, and so on, and offset. So I'll just set this up. Okay, so this is sort of interesting. So format is specifying sort of how many numbers do we have and how many, you know, what's the format? Is it a float, an integer, and so on? How many bytes, how many bits per uh, thing? So I'm going to go with, I want for position a two-dimensional. So I'm going to go R, 32, because we're going to have 32 bits there for that float. G, 32. We have a bunch of um, suffixes here. We have s float for signed float, s int for signed integer, u int for unsigned integer, and so on. And I'm going to go with uh, s float, signed floating point numbers. And then we'll go offset. Okay, cool. And then we'll set up the color. So I'll set the color to be shader location one. Now for the format, we're gonna go red, green, blue. Also side note, it's a little bit strange that this has been standardized. So we might expect format to be X, Y, but just to standardize things, we always go red, green, blue, alpha, just for whatever reason. And the offset, we're gonna go two floats in Okay, cool. So we've got that. This These functions will return the binding description and the attribute descriptions. Cool. So those are consumed in setting up the pipeline. So if we go to pipeline and then right the way down, make render pass below that uh, to make the graphics pipeline. So the first stage here is vertex input. Before I do anything, I'm going to grab... Um, those things that I made before. Oh, of course, I'm going to have to import that. So just go up the top. Yep, so just importing mesh and then we'll head down. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so now we can use them. See down below, we have vertex binding description count will be one. And then vertex binding descriptions will be a pointer to this one here. Then uh, attribute descriptions is two. 
And then we'll need a pointer to the data there, which we can get by getting the, whoops, there we have it. Okay, cool. So now we have specified at pipeline creation, the exact um, bindings and attributes for the vertex buffer. So we can run this and it won't do anything. All it will really do is complain because we're not sending in any data. There we have it. It runs very slowly. And if we look back here, it's basically complaining that we haven't bound a vertex buffer. And we haven't even specified that we're not binding a vertex buffer. That's fine, we'll fix that up in a second. Okay, so we're back because we need to investigate how to sort of make buffers. Okay, so here are my sort of research notes that I put together when I was planning this section out. So uh, basically we have something called, uh, where are we? If we want to create a buffer, we have this uh, buffer create info struct, which we sort of populate the various bits. We have the flags, um, that's fine. Size, this should be familiar. That's the number of uh, bytes of memory that we use. Uh, usage, two flags that really stood out for me, a transfer destination and uh, vertex buffer usage. There's a whole bunch of different flags we can set there for usage. Um, sharing mode, so typically we'll have one graphics card and the graphics card will be the same hunk of silicon that renders the graphics and presents them to the screen. But we might be working on a different system with multiple graphics cards or multiple different devices and things. Um, and they might both need to share the same vertex buffer for whatever reason. So we can set whether we're going to be exclusively using one um, Q family or if it's going to be owned or shared by multiple Q families. And it said in the documentation that um, sharing, sharing the vertex buffer may be slower. And um, we can also share vertex buffers, which are in exclusive mode. We just need to explicitly transfer ownership, which I guess could have some overhead. Um, and yeah, then just the usual things. And then down here, um, this is the sort of structure that I'm going to go with. So I'll have our engine and our engine will know about a vertex buffer and that vertex buffer will be defined somewhere else. I'm calling this a triangle mesh object. The thing is each buffer has sort of the VK buffer object and a memory object to sort of back that up. Even images, like everything, we have the object <clears throat> and memory sort of backing that resource up. So if we look inside the the util namespace, or if you're watching this in the Python series, it's, it's, whoops, there's no namespaces. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> we'll have a file in there called memory. And that memory will have a bunch of routines. We'll be able to create a buffer, find a required memory type, and then allocate memory for the buffer. And this will be interfaced with the triangle mesh. It'll call those and get the return values. And that'll be done via structs. I'll probably, I'll probably make a simple buffer struct with a, a buffer object and a buffer memory object. Yeah, there we have it. So this whole finding a memory type is non-trivial. If it were RAM, then we would just have what regular like it, it's sort of uniform it's it's ram is ram we just grab a chunk of ram somewhere um allocate something on the heap by the way if you're not familiar with this a heap is any sort of memory location where you can dynamically sort of allocate reallocate or free memory on the fly at runtime but it turns out that the graphics card is not ram the graphics card has a whole bunch of different uh, memory locations, a whole bunch of different heaps with different properties, different sort of visibility, different access speeds and things like that. The classic example in Vulkan is we have memory, which is host visible on the card. That's um, <clears throat> heaps, which we can sort of map to via... Um, <clears throat> sorry, via our program. So in Python and in C++, we can map to uh, host visible memory 
and send data there. Um, but it's not the fastest. There are other heap locations which are closer to the actual graphics hardware. Those are device local, um, but we can't get to them directly. That'll actually be in a future video. But, 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 in order to do any of this work, the vertex buffer that we create will have certain requirements. And that is um, given here by this, where are we? Get buffer memory requirements. So we make a buffer, we pass it in, we say, hey, what are the memory, what are the memory requirements for this buffer? And there are all these things. We have a certain size that we request, a certain alignment. Um, and this is a big one, a certain memory type. Okay, so this is a little bit funky. I've just had to do a double take on this. My notes are actually correct. What am I even thinking? Um, so we have memory properties that we're requesting, but as well as that, this uh, memory requirements will tell us which types of memory in other words, which sort of heap locations, if that makes sense, are supported by our device. So this is sort of a bit mask and individual bits are set based on whether the corresponding, um, yeah, whether the corresponding um, memory location, memory type at that location is supported. And likewise, we can also get the uh, physical device memory properties, and that's a sort of a struct, which has a whole bunch of things. We have memory type count, fair enough. Um, and then we have an array of memory type structs. And these are, we have property flags. So these are the properties which are supported by each of these memory types. And a heap index as well, um, which would go along with these memory heaps, so the various locations of memory on the device. Okay, so what we need is in order to get, in order to allocate memory, we need to find an appropriate memory type. And in order to do that, we are going to need to have a function that sort of checks these things against each other. So we get the memory requirements, we throw that into our function, and then we check it against our physical device memory properties and get a memory type that matches. All right, so let's get into it. All right, so let's get that memory file running. We'll just go ahead and add a new item and that will be a header. And this is where we're going to define those functions. So we'll include uh, the regular. Okay, so um, let's have a look at this. So what we wanna do is we wanna sort of output a struct which has a uh, regular VK, like a Vulcan buffer. And uh, what is this device memory? Okay, and um, like I said, there's sort of a number of steps involved in this. And I'm going to start with the buffer creation. Okay, so just grabbing this from the documentation. In order to create a buffer, we'll need to basically populate this um, buffer create info struct and um, Okay, so we'll go ahead and create one. Now this is going to be an issue, right? Because we're going to need to specify somehow the size and then usage of the buffer. So let's create a struct to, um, to hold that. Okay, so we have, yeah, the number of bytes and how we are intending to use that. So we'll just um, put that in here. Oh, we're gonna have to specify that. OK, 
Okay, cool. And the last sort of bit that we need to set is the sharing mode. And we'll just hard code this. I don't have any intentions of I don't have any intentions of worrying about um, concurrent usage. So in other words, multiple graphics families using it. I'm just gonna sorry, multiple Q families using it. I'm just gonna hard code it in exclusive mode and uh, yeah, won't worry about that. So um, what we need to do is we need a logical device because the uh, buffer is sort of created by a logical device. So no problem. We can go back up to the struct and specify that we are going to take a Vulkan device in our input. So then we'll have access to that. Okay, create buffer. Now, as you can see here, um, we have the create info we pass in, and then all of these other arguments are optional. The allocator by default is nothing, the default, and the dispatch by default is the static dispatch loader. So all good. Um, also, side note, this trips me up a few times. Um, the create info is taking a reference. So in other words, we can just pass in that buffer info as if it's a, a thing. Now it says here, this returns a buffer. So we, um, in the C, in the C API, we would pass that in a pointer to be populated, but here we can um, simply take it as a return value. There we have it. Okay. And actually I'm just gonna, why not, it's up to you. So um, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna have a buffer struct that I make there, and then I'm gonna populate its buffer field with this created buffer, which, um, yep, it's up to you if you wanna do it this way or a different way, that's fine. Okay, cool. So we've got that. The next thing we'll need to do is sort of allocate the memory, and before I worry about that, I'm going to just write the function which will find the memory type index. So this is going to return a number which specifies the index on the graphics card, which memory type we want to select. So we're gonna go return a 32-bit unsigned integer. Now we're going to need a physical device in order to query various properties. And well, where's that gonna come from? It's gonna to have to come from the input struct that we define up above. So we'll go ahead and add that as another one of the fields. Okay, no worries. Okay, so there's a few extra fields here. Um, this supported memory indices, as I was saying a second ago, it is a 32-bit unsigned integer, and each of the bits of it is basically specifying whether that um, memory location is supported, basically. And we get that from querying the memory requirements. It also returns the set of all memory locations that our device can support. Okay, so um, where was I? We'll just pop over to the documentation if it's useful. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the device memory properties and it's gonna return all these things. We'll have the number of memory types and then these structs, and these structs will actually have sort of uh, inbuilt properties. We have an array of those, and then we have these memory heaps. We're not going to touch the memory heaps at the moment, but anyway, we're going to need to get those, get those memory properties. So we'll go, this will give us, oops, the physical device memory properties will be given here. 
we call it just like that. Now, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to loop through all of the possible memory locations. And then at that memory location, we're going to check two things. Is the memory location supported by our device? And does it match all of the properties which we are looking for? So anyway, Okay, so I'm actually going to break this into several steps. No reason to do it one way or the other. I just, I like it that way. Uh, so we go supported, take the supported memory indices, and I want to check if the bit in position I has been set. So what I'll do is I'll take a bitwise and with uh, this really simple bit mask, I'm just taking one and I'm shifting it by the required position. So as a few examples, let's say, um, let's say three. Okay. So memory position three or type index three or however you want to say this, has that been set? So if I take one and I shift it three bits to the left, then that is the number eight, basically. And I take the bitwise and with this number and let's say this is, mm, why is this so hard? Nine, nine. So this is actually supporting, I guess, position zero and position three, because we have one and eight. So from this bitwise and it zeroes out everything except for the eight, everything except for the one in the third position in the third byte bit, I mean, um, and then this result is non-zero because the result is non-zero as a Boolean, it counts as true basically, but really all we need to remember is position I will be set to one if it is supported. And so by taking a bitwise and between these, this will return whether supported memory indices includes the ith bit if that even makes sense. Okay, so the next test is, is this memory type sufficient? And what is this? Well, the, uh, let's see. So we can go to the memory properties. Okay, and we'll look at um, memory type I because we have this um, location that we're looking at. Look at the property flags. There we go, memory types. Okay, so we access memory types I, and then we get the property flags for that memory type. And we take a bitwise and with the requested properties. And this requested properties is a sort of bit field. So let's say that Let's go with nine again. Okay. So whatever the underlying enum is, um, bit number zero and bit number three need to be supported. Those are the two properties that we want for our memory um, chunk. The, the bit number zero could represent like host visible and bit number three could represent, um, I don't know, host coherent is the other one. That means that when the data is written, it's written directly. There's no need to worry about synchronization like it happens on the spot. So if I want to check that those two are satisfied, it or a bitwise and, and then this, this property flags could hold a whole bunch of properties, but I'm just checking that it has both of these properties. So to check that it has both of those properties, I want to check that the result of applying that is that we just have the same property. So taking a bitwise and does not remove properties which were requested. So again, I'll say this again. When I take this bitwise and, if I'm requesting bit number zero and bit number three, and those are supported, then the result will be all zeros except for bit zero and bit three. But if bit zero, for instance, is not supported, then I might just get bit three as a result of applying this um, this bit mask, and then that won't match, and it's not sufficient. It's not supporting everything that we need it to. Okay, so we have that, 
And now our test is pretty simple actually. So if the memory type that we're looking at is supported and it's sufficient, no worries. Well, then we just return that index. So there we have it. Okay, so no worries, it's a little bit esoteric, but hopefully this is sort of making sense. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna make a function that allocates memory to the buffer. This will be actually using the um, function I just wrote to find the type index. So we'll go, okay. Okay, so, yep, this will sort of be a wrapper for, um, no, it's not a wrapper, it's just a regular function. So, um, again, from the documentation, what I want to do is I want to get the memory requirements for this buffer. So I want to say, hey, I'm going to make this buffer. What do we require? So we'll get some... Okay, cool. So this takes the Vulcan buffer from this buffer struct and returns a struct itself, which has all of these fields. We don't need to worry about um, things like alignment for now. All right, so that, that'll be more of, a, more of a thing when we look at storage buffers, but uh, we'll leave that for now. All right, so now what I wanna do is I want to sort of allocate memory to the buffer. So I'll make this uh, the structure here, and I need to set a few things. I need to set um, the allocation size. Actually, I should probably get this from the memory requirements. Why not? Okay, and then, um, the memory type index, and that's the one where we're going to use the function above. Okay, so we need the physical device, the supported memory indices, so we get that by going memory requirements, memory type bits, okay, and then the requested properties, okay, so I'm going to request So you have a whole bunch of options here. I'm going to go, not device local, I'm going to go, oh, worry, host visible and host coherent. So again, host visible means that we can write to it from our program directly. And um, host coherent means that when we write, perform a write operation, that happens straight on the spot. We don't need to worry about synchronization. All right, so we're almost there. Now we go um, get the logical device and allocate some memory based on this allocation info. There we have it. So then, actually should probably go, should probably do this as well. Should probably bind the buffer memory and this sort of associates the buffer with the actual memory. So we'll go. All right, so we bind the buffer with its memory and the other um, field that we need to set is the memory offset. I'm gonna start this at a memory offset of zero because um, yeah, why not? So it'll start from the start. Okay, cool. So there we have it. The next task will be to create a uh, triangle mesh object, which uses these functions to create a proper um, vertex buffer and then allocates its own memory. And then we'll need to go into the shader and set that up. Anyway, let's get on to that. Now, I almost forgot there's something that we missed. Here we are allocating, allocating the memory. What are we allocating it to? We want to allocate it to buffer dot buffer memory. If we look here, that is not one of the arguments, but a device memory is the return type. So what we can do is we can say buffer 
is equal to that. And that will sort of, oh, what's a, comp ah, right. Yeah, because I set this as a constant reference. Let's not do that. And now that's working. Okay, awesome. So let's uh, press on. We're on the final stretch now, so I'll try to sort of take it from front to back. Now, I did notice when I tested this code that I was having some issues. We can go to um, this memory file here and these structures, for whatever reason in the final version, it complains that um, structures are being multiply defined. So we can grab those structures and just put them into the configuration header, which everything has access to. That should solve the problem. Um, and then it's also going to complain that these functions are sort of multiply defined and we can get around that by actually just declaring them here and defining them in their own file. So we can just go, just add the source file there. So I'm just sort of declaring these to be within the namespace and yep, no worries, I guess. Okay, so now when we, when we compile this, the, um, well, where are we? These will just be function declarations. They can just be declared uh, once, or oh, actually, sorry, they can be declared as many times as we want, but they will only be defined once because they are, well, there's a level of indirection there. So it will go to, the compiler will go to the, the source file, the .cpp file, compile that separately. That'll be a separate translation object. Part of the fun of having a header only library, I guess. All right, cool. So we've got that. In theory, this should be sort of working. Um, now I want to go to the shader and I want to go to the vertex shader and just get rid of this. We're not going to hard code the positions anymore. Instead of that, we're going to take these as um, attributes. So we'll go the rest of this is fine and we can apply the position over here and the color right down the bottom. The rest of this should be fine. But, um, so I wanna compile these and to compile them, I'm gonna run my script, but I have sort of upgraded my Vulkan version recently. So I just need to change this over and this is a good thing to keep an eye on if you upgrade your uh, Vulkan version at any point. All right, cool. So this should now run and we can go ahead and run it. Or not run it, but you know, compile it. Okay, it's compiled with no errors. And we can see that both of these have now updated. Cool, awesome. So that is all good. Alrighty. Now what I want to do is I want to make a file to describe my uh, basic triangle mesh. So I'll go ahead and create that. Okay, cool. So these are the functions we're going to have. The constructor will basically construct the vertex buffer and then send over the memory for that, you know, allocate the memory and do all of that stuff. So for that, we're going to need the logical device in order to perform device operations to create the buffer. And we're going to need physical device in order to do memory operations. Okay. Um, then in the destructor, we're going to basically destroy, um, the components of this buffer object. 
and we're going to need to store the logical device because that will be used in the destruction functions later on. So now we can jump in and write the source code for this. Okay, I'm being lazy, so I'll copy the, the vertex data in. But basically, it is the first three are the positions. Sorry, first two are the positions. And the last three, I'm going to make these triangles all green. So if I run this and I have no errors and I see solid green triangles, that is successful. Okay, so... Just going to specify that this will be used as a vertex buffer. Okay, so now we can create the vertex buffer. And now we're going to send... Oh, yeah, of course we need to specify that. Now we need to send this data to the vertex buffer. So how do we send data to a vertex buffer? Well, the way the video card works is we're going to... So the video card has a range of space in the RAM that it can monitor. So what we do is we get a mapped location for um, our, our buffer memory object. And this is specifying... Let's say, what do we have here? 5 times 3, so 15... That's totally not, that's totally not right. Um, yeah, vertices size will return 15, because we have 15 elements. Okay, 15 times 5, so 75 bytes. Okay, so let's say we're requesting 75 bytes of data. We tell uh, Vulkan, yeah, we're requesting 75 bytes of data. Where should we write it to in RAM? And Vulkan looks at its um, space that it can look at and allocates some space there and says, okay, write your... Um, write your data to this location. And when we write our data to that location in RAM, I've had a look at the documentation. I'm not sure what happens, but I believe most likely is Vulkan also sets up a kind of interrupt routine where when that location, that mapped range has been written to, it directs its data bus and sends the data along to that data bus. So this is achieved by um, calling map memory. So we go. So we call map memory. And again, what I'm saying is we're asking Vulcan, where should we write? Where should we write to, to ensure that we are writing to this, um, buffer memory that it gets shipped over there. Buffer memory. That's the thing that we're writing to. The offset is uh, zero, because we want to write to the start. And then the amount of data that we're writing will be... We can reuse the same size parameter that we set here. Now, because of um, device alignments, we may not get 75 bytes. For instance, it might have to allocate 64 bytes at a time, in which case 128 bytes would be allocated on the card for the underlying memory. But we are still writing the first 75 bytes, so it's still acceptable to put this in. Now, flags, we do not have to set anything, and dispatch loader, we do not have to set anything. So what this does is it tells us the a pointer to the start of the memory location on RAM where we should write it. So now we can go ahead and write to that RAM location. So we'll go mem copy. So that will basically copy all of the contents of this vertices array. Ah, sorry, I'm thinking of the size function of a vector. Okay, cool. So we have that. What we also need to do 
is after doing this, we need to unmap the memory because like I said, there's a strong chance that it's set up an interrupt, you know, an interrupt routine, which could be continually checking that um, memory location for any subsequent writes. And there's some overhead to that. And also, I mean, Vulkan, the API does have a limit on the number of active uh, memory maps, that, the, the amount of things which can actively be mapped at any point. So it's a great idea to unmap it free that memory map once we are done with it. Uh, so go vertex. And another note here is that this buffer memory can only be mapped um, at, uh, can only be mapped um, or unmapped. It can't be mapped and then try to map it again. That will throw an error and it can't be unmapped and then try to map it again. Unmap it again. That will throw an error. Bit of a tongue twister. Anyway, cool. So Essentially what this does is it uploads these vertices to some place and the graphics card grabs that and throws it internally. So now we'll make the destructor. Okay, so we'll destroy the buffer and then free the memory. Okay. So that is looking all right. Now we'll go to the engine and go to the header file. And we'll just sort of um, grab the triangle mesh. And then after the, down here, after the synchronization objects, I'm also going to have sort of an asset catalog. So I will have at the moment, it's not much, it's just one. And then after finalizing setup, I'm also going to make the assets, which again, at this point, it's not doing a lot. And I'm also going to put in another placeholder function, which I'll call prepare scene. And this will Again, not do a lot, but as my engine gets more complicated, we'll be doing more things here. But yeah, essentially it's just going to uh, bind the vertex buffer at this point. Okay, so I think that's okay. Let's get, um, let's go a little bit further. So we go to the engine, source code, and then in the constructor, after finalizing the setup, we'll make the assets. Okay, um, all of this is fine. We can leave it. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so we're just creating a triangle mesh. And yeah, we just need one. Okay, so then we'll go and create, uh, prepare the scene. Okay, cool. So we just, uh, because this is bind vertex buffers, we do have the option to bind multiple buffers, but um, I'm just gonna bind one. So we're gonna go first binding is zero and then we're going to bind one vertex buffer. And the pointer there is this vertex buffers and the pointer to the offsets is this one, offsets. Okay, cool. So that is how we will prepare the scene. And if we go down to the record draw commands, just after binding the pipeline, we can go ahead and set that scene up. And yeah, that's otherwise that's looking good. So don't need to worry about the render. Uh, clean up swap chain is fine. Now down here, before we destroy the device, Let's delete our triangle mesh. And that will call the destructor, which will 
based on the logical device, it will free all the memory and stuff. So fingers crossed, let's see what happens. Which side note, every time I press this button, I'm expecting an error. That's just life. Uh, yes, okay, what is it? Just one, conversion from integer to bool requires a narrowing conversion. Okay, no worries. So that was in memory, I imagine. It's probably in this find memory index. Yeah, so here we're going to get an integer. We can explicitly explicitly say, hey, I expect this to be a bool and I'm all right with that. <laughs> What's going on? PKUtil create buffer. Yes, it should return a value. So what is it doing? Oh, did I not finish that function off? That's uh, that's sort of cringe. Okay, so we've got the buffer. We'll allocate the memory. Okay, third time's the charm. I probably type that so quickly that it's just gonna, oh, no, okay, awesome, cool. Alrighty, so uh, before we had multicolored triangles, now we control the color, they are green. Frame rate doesn't seem too bad. It is resizing and working correctly. And yeah, very cool, very cool. So it's been a bit of a marathon session. We covered a, a number of different concepts, treaded and retreaded the same code base. That's fine. Um, link in the descri description down below for the full code. And yeah, all the best. And yeah, have a good one. Bye.